and this is why I wanted to come back. Um, this is why I wanted to be here. Um, it's home. It's a community I'm familiar with. It's very comforting for me to see the, the general enthusiasm and positivity that's around the team right now. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co-host, Joe DeMeo, with a very special guest in Mets President of Baseball Operations, David Stearns. David, we've been uh, we've been hoping to get you on for a long time. We're really happy to make this happen. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad we found a time and uh, look forward to the discussion. So in some of your early media availabilities, which Joe and I track like crazy, we've really enjoyed listening to you talk about this job since you got it. You spoke in depth about learning this organization, right? You come into a world where there's just so many layers to a baseball organization. Can you point out a couple of things that you didn't know at the time that maybe have impressed you so far after a couple of months in? Yeah, there's a lot. I think when you when you come into a new organization and something of this size, I mean, we have we have 300 people, not even including all of our players in baseball operations. When you think about our entire minor league system, our medical apparatus, our scouts all over the world, and so there, there's a huge learning curve to understand um, one who all these people are and and what are we doing really well and and where can we um, where can we potentially improve. And so that's been a big part of my job. Um, over the first uh, now half year or so um, since I've, I've been here, that, that process never really ends. It, it'll continue. Um, and I, I think people always ask me, like, when, when are you going to feel comfortable? When are you going to feel like you really know everything that's going on? And I think it takes a full cycle. I think it takes really that full year so that you can go through everything uh, in the baseball calendar with your entire organization, with your people. Um, and so we're about halfway through that right now. I, I will say I've been impressed um, by the overall desire within our group to be great, um, the recognition of what our goal here, and that's to be a championship caliber organization. And, and that existed when I showed up. Um, that, and that's been really encouraging for me uh, to, to get to know this group and, and understand that at every level, there is this desire um, to be the best in baseball. And that's a nice starting point. On this show, we've heaped a lot of praise on Carlos Mendoza for his in-game tactics as a manager and then as well as his handling of the media, which we know is important here in New York. Uh, to my knowledge, there was no previous relationship between you and Mendoza uh, when you hired him as manager. It almost felt like old school. He kind of won the job in the interview process. What were your big takeaways in the interview process that had you land on Mendoza? And through about 40 games, has he lived up to the hype for you? I think I think what Mendy brought to the table was not only his his performance in the interview process, which was which was great, but all of the experience and references and people who reached out in support of him along the way. I, I think when we go through a process like this, especially for a position as important as major league manager, you're not just basing it off of four different interview sessions, right? You're not just going down and, and who presents the best during that period, it's gathering an enormous amount of, of information um, on each candidate and trying to figure out who is going to best fit the organization that, that we're trying to collectively build. And Mendy did distinguish himself. And, and it was for a variety of reasons, but I think um, chief among them was his authenticity throughout the process. Um, he's a person who's very comfortable with who he is and and I think that allows him to relate in a very authentic way, uh, not only to players, but to front office, to media, to ownership. And, and that came through not only in what he displayed to us through the interview process, but also in terms of how he's conducted himself throughout his, his entire career. David, we've also noticed with him, he just uses the full roster week in and week out. There's really nothing wasted from top to bottom. Even with the DH in the NL right now and, you know, all this available data for matchups, do you think it's made the importance of the length of the bench even that much more significant in today's game? I, I think the entire roster is incredibly significant, not just the 26, but 
the 40 and, and then beyond. Um, we go through a lot of players over the course of a major league season. We have different matchups that benefit different skill sets. And I think Carlos has done a tremendous job of putting our players in position to succeed. And when, and when we talk about game management, that's really what it comes down to. We're trying to put individual players in the best possible position to be successful. And sometimes it's going to work out and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but as long as we're continuing to follow those principles to, to try to help our players succeed, um, that's all we can ask a manager to do. And, and I think he's done a really great job of that so far. So here at SNY, I do a lot of coverage on the farm system and uh, the MLB draft that will be coming up here in a couple of months. And two of the significant hires that you made this past offseason was Chris Gross to be the vice president of amateur scouting and Andy Green to be the vice president of player development. Can you talk to the process of hiring those two and what type of impact you think they can have on the scouting and development departments, respectfully? Yeah, so similar to a managerial search process, those are two very important decisions um, that can help shape the direction of your organization. So we took those hirings very seriously and I took those hirings very seriously. Uh, and they really came about in, in a couple of different ways. Chris uh, Gross and I have had some past experience together. Uh, we overlapped in Houston for a couple of years, was very impressed with him uh, when, I, when I worked with him previously and, and have watched his career grow from afar. And so I knew coming into this role, if we were going to add to that department in a leadership capacity, Chris was going to be a very strong candidate. I didn't know if he would get the job, um, but I knew he was going to be a very strong candidate. And I think the contributions he's made to the Astros over the years uh, speaks to the type of evaluator is evaluator he is and the type of leader he can be um, within the domestic scouting space. Um, Andy was very different. Um, Andy, uh, I met for the first time uh, through our managerial search process, um, and he was a very strong candidate in, in that process. And uh, during that process, I kept on thinking how, Im how impactful he might be in a development capacity. Um, he, he, he's very passionate about player development. He has a player development background. He cares a great deal about young players. Uh, and that was true when he was the manager of the San Diego Padres. It was his ability to impact young players was evident there. His ability to impact young players was evident as the bench coach of the Chicago Cubs. Um, and then as, as things played out and, and the managerial carousel um, kind of calmed down and, and the seats were taken, um, I reached out to him to see whether he'd have any interest in pursuing more of a front office role. And I, I think it, it probably caught him uh, by surprise a little bit at first. Um, I don't know if it's something that he had, he had seriously considered before, um, but the more he thought about it, the more we talked about it, I, I think we both felt like it was a great fit. Uh, and I've really enjoyed working with him and getting to know him and, and, and watching him really shape uh, player development here. So with the amount of games this team has just without days off, we've heard a lot of talk about the six man rotation, even directly from Mendoza. And you look at the way the rotation's constructed. I mean, Kodai Senga will be coming back, has shown more comfort uh, throwing on five days rest than Christian Scott. You know, obviously a guy that 87 innings or so last year is going to be some kind of close, full, uh, watchful eye on him there. When you look at it, do you think this is a situation, the way the rotation's constructed, that it just benefits everybody at some point moving to a six-man rotation? Yeah, what, I, what I'd imagine going forward is more often than not, we're going to try to get guys the extra day of rest, um, whether that's by inserting the, the sixth man, uh, whether it's through taking advantage of off days in the schedule when they, when they come. Um, and I realize we don't have a lot coming up, but eventually they'll come. Uh, I think it, 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 more often than not, we will try to get guys the extra day or two of rest. Um, there may be a couple turns where we're not able to. Um, whether it's because of injuries, whether it's because of how we have to manage our bullpen to get an extra arm in the pen. Um, and, and so there, there are times it may be impossible, but yeah, w once we get Kodai back for sure, now that Scotty is here, um, it, it makes sense to try to, uh, to try to get the extra day. So looking ahead beyond obviously this year, given you have the college game, they pitch once a week. Now there's such an influx of Japanese pitchers com coming over from Japan. They pitch once a week. And even in minor league baseball, it's not very common that pitchers pitch more than once in a given week. Could you see six-man rotations becoming much more of a norm in the sport and maybe eventually trending away from kind of the standard five-man starting rotation? 
You know, it's, it's a really interesting topic. It's something I've thought a lot about. Um, we've discussed a lot here and we've got tension points on both sides of this issue. So on, on the one hand, we'd like our stars to go deeper. Um, we'd like to keep them as healthy as possible. Both of those and the developmental factors are real that you mentioned. So all three of those would point to, yeah, let's let's as an industry transition a little bit more towards an extra day of rest, a six man rotation. On the other side, we've got um, limits on numbers of pitchers we can have in the big leagues. We've got an extended option recall period now back to 15 days. It used to be 10 days for pitchers. Um, and we've got limitations on the number of times we can we can recall an option players now up and down. And so those work in conflict to each other. Ideally, in a six man rotation, you'd be able to carry the 14 pitchers um, so you can carry the full pen. Or if you couldn't carry the 14 pitchers, you'd be able to rotate guy through your pen with um, a little bit more ease by recalling them a little bit earlier and not being worried about running out of um, about running out of options in season. So um, I don't know the answer to it. Um, I think I think it's a challenging one because we have these conflicting um, sets of, of incentives in play here in terms of how we manage a, a pitching staff. And David, isn't so much of it too? I mean, how many teams can sit there and go, hey, we got six healthy arms that we feel right, great yeah. about right now in a sport where everybody's scratching and clawing and trying to find ways of volume of pitching. And that kind of brings me to my next question. Joe and I, we constantly track just trends with team building and something we've talked a lot about with you because obviously you haven't been here too long. There's only so much we could track, but is the volume strategy with the bullpen and it's paid massive dividends for this team right out of the gate. I mean, some of the guys pitching in high leverage situations, I would say 99% of Mets fans didn't even know before the season started you know, what is that process like for you from actually scouting these arms and them having to project roles going into the long stretch of the season? So we actually do our best not to project roles, right? You're going to uh, you, you break camp. You're going to have some idea of how that that first week is going to roll from a leverage standpoint. Um, but we've all been around this enough to understand how bullpens evolve over the course of the year. And it, it's really tough to predict what your bullpen's gonna look like in July or August based on what you have coming out of spring training. So what we've tried to do and the philosophy that I try to take is just give ourselves as many options as possible um, with the understanding that uh, if we do our job from a developmental standpoint and from a, 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 a pitching coach standpoint, we should help be able to help some of these guys improve. Um, and we should be able to find ways uh, for these guys to contribute at the major league level. And hopefully while we're doing that, we're creating different looks out of our pen. So hopefully we're not uh, just um, acquiring the same type of pitcher over and over and over. I think it's very helpful for a manager and a pitching coach in game to be able to go down to their pen and have guys with different stuff packages um, that allow them to match up to a particular run of hitters, uh, maybe a little bit more effectively than than if we're just um, acquiring the same type of pitcher. So those are the, some of the things I think about. But um, look, I wouldn't have projected Reed Garrett to have the type of start to the year that he had. I thought he'd impact our major league team. Um, uh, certainly what we saw in spring training was really exciting, and, and it was clear he was getting better and really buying in um, to some of the developmental principles uh, that we had hoped he would buy into. But, but he's been arguably the best reliever in baseball, and that would be pretty tough for anyone um anyone to predict so it's well known that you're a Mets fan uh, it's not I don't think I'm breaking news to anyone we've we've heard it quite a bit how has it been being back in New York because you know most of the interviews it was you were just getting the spring training and now you're in the crux of the season are yeah. the ticket requests from family and friends getting ridiculous at this point and just how's everything being back home it, it's it's been great I, I mean the the how the community has welcomed me and my family um, has been great. The positivity of the fan base as a whole, uh, not only towards me, but but the team in general. Um, I think the way uh, our group rallied around Lindor, for example, um, the the way the we, the reactions we've gotten off of a couple of uh, really exciting walk off wins. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and this is why I wanted to come back. Um, this is why I wanted to be here. Um, it's home. It's a community I'm familiar with. Um, and it's very comforting 
for me to see the, the general enthusiasm and positivity that's around the team right now. So you've talked a lot also about your internship with the Mets after college under, at the time, Omar Minaya was the GM. What exactly did that role entail? And is there any specific memories that you, you take away from that experience? Yeah. So like, like a lot of internships, um, the role entailed everything. Um, getting from, coffee. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah you know, everything. Lunch it, you know, go out, grab, grab lunch for the group, um, and bring it back. Um, uh, you know, photocopying to, to being able to really dig in on the Mets scouting processes at the time to understand, um, what was really an evolving baseball analytics landscape at the time and begin to have some of those conversations to understand how major league transactions work. Um, and look, what I, what I remember, um, is a group that was incredibly open, uh, to, to me asking questions um to to me wanting to learn and, and who provided me the guidance and the time to do that so I, i'm incredibly indebted to that experience um it unquestionably shaped uh my career from that point forward um and, and i'm really appreciative of omar and and everyone who was a part of that front office at that point there's been a lot of buzz surrounding Christian Scott, obviously, with uh, two good starts to start off his career. And often that's the case when top prospects get their opportunity to to burst <laughs> onto the major league scene. Uh, do you see a pathway for more top prospects in the system making an impact on the big league team this year? And generally, how do you balance giving young players, because and, and the word runway, you use that often, and I've stolen that, so thank you, um, given runway at, at the big league level, uh, to go through the natural ups and downs that happen for a young player, make uh, you know, reaching the big leagues while also yeah. maintaining the expectations of being a playoff team. It, it is a balance, and there's no formula to this. Um, it, it's it's more of a feel than anything else. Um, and, and the the truth is, it's tougher in New York. Um, it, it is tougher to allow young players to go through the growing pains. Uh, that you often experience at the major league level in New York than, than for example, in Milwaukee. Um, and that's just the reality of the market sizes. It's reality of the expectations that surround teams. It's the reality of expectations that surround players when they're called up. Um, and that's okay. And, and we have to learn um, to accommodate that, but we also still have to give our players the best chance to succeed. So I try to preach patience um, as much as I possibly can. I've seen so many good players, really good players, um, have their, have their difficulties at the front end of their major league careers. Um, and the best thing generally that organizations can do with them is still stick with them, um, and, and provide them growth opportunities, um, continue to provide them feedback. Uh, and, and most of the time it, it really does pay dividends, not only for the player, but for the organization as well. All right, David, last one before we let you go. We want to play a quick game of the Mets pod Mount Rushmore, and this is perfect for you. Because as a as someone that grew up a fan of the Mets, do you have four games that you attended as a fan for your Mount Rushmore? And road games apply if you've been to them uh, on the road as well. And if you don't have a full four, you could mix in just actual Mets fan memories. I think I have four. Okay. Um, okay. So number one, um, first game back after 9-11. Um, I, was, I was at that one. Um, tough to beat that in any any sort of sporting event. Um, that was, that was pretty remarkable. Um, uh, number two, Todd Pratt walk-off. Um, that was a, a very memorable one for me. I was at that with my grandfather who was a lifelong national league baseball fan. Um, so very memorable. Um, number three for me, uh, probably the, the grand slam single game, um, was at that one as well. Uh, I got really sick, uh, from that one, Had, get it, watching four and a half hours of baseball in, in a, in a driving cold rainstorm, uh, for, for that day. Um, and then number four, I'd probably go with that famous fireworks day at Shea where, um, the Mets scored 10 in the eighth off of the Braves, um, capped by a, a Mike Piazza Homer. Um, uh, I was at that one. I was at that one too. So. Those would be the four, uh, the four I'd pick. Those are so, some pretty great Shea memories, Joe. 
So great memories. And I, I've admitted this on this show before. I was also at the Piazza Braves game, but my mom made us leave early. So I heard the end oh. of the radio. Oh, no. <laughs> the worst. That's an all time. I love my mom. And we were at the Mother's Day game on uh, on Mother's Day. So love her, diehard Mets fan. But yeah, she she made me leave that game. And I haven't I haven't exactly forgiven her for it. Yeah, you know, it's it. Uh, you think back to to that game, um, and then the September 11th, the the the, the game immediately after September 11th, uh, first game after September 11th, and both are remembered for big Mike Piazza home runs. Um, what's often forgotten in both of those games, those home runs were immediately preceded by incredible Edgardo Alfonso at bats. So in the 10 run comeback inning, um, Alfonso, I think on a two strike pitch. Uh, got a single through the shortstop hole that got the inning to Piazza and allowed him to hit the big homer. Um, and then uh, in the, the game immediately following September 11th, Alfonso worked out the key walk against Steve Carse um, on, on what may or may not have been strike three or ball four, we're not sure. Um, but he gets to first base, gets the inning to Piazza, and then, and then obviously history um, history happens. Yeah, maybe one of the most underappreciated players in Mets history, Edgardo uh, Alfonso, yeah. of course. Well, David, thank you so much. We really, really enjoyed getting to talk to you, and and we're really excited for the future of the Mets, a large part because you're here now. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate today. that. Thank you, guys. All right, great stuff, of course, from the president of baseball operations for the Mets, David Stearns. Joe, you could just tell how authentic of a fan he was growing up. I mean, to rip off those level of games, the appreciation for Fonzie, uh, the moments, and then the things that you and I talk about every week on this show, actually team-building aspects. I think it stood out to me that he goes, we don't project roles in the bullpen because it goes to show you how fluid you have to be because of how long the baseball season is. So just really great stuff all around from David Stearns. Yeah, love chatting with him and was glad to ask him about the six-man rotation stuff because we've talked about that quite a bit on this show. So it was good to get the perspective of someone that, you know, actually can decide if this happens or not. <laughs> and, you know, he gave, you know, some things about it that I didn't even think about. I just thought of it logically of college starters, Japanese starters, the way the minor leagues are set up. And there's quotes in articles from players that say they like having the extra day of rest more. Um, and there's stats to back up that it makes sense, but there's all these other underlying factors with the options and how you can construct um, your pitching staff because of the max amount of pitchers you could have. So it's, as you point out, these two like conflicting points that it's kind of hard to find the balance, but I think eventually we'll find a way there. I think so too. And yeah, just you bring up how hard it is, of course, to find the volume of pitching. An idea might sound great in theory, but then when it comes time to find a guy to be the sixth starter or injuries kick in and you need a new four and five, it's just really, really difficult. You're listening to the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SNY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your shows. All right, Joe, as we always do, let's go down on the farm because two big promotions from Brooklyn to Binghamton, Ryan Clifford, really the guy viewed as the slugger in the Mets system. He came back from the Houston Astros at the trade deadline for Justin Verlander last year. And Brandon Sprout, who has essentially been untouchable at the Brooklyn level this year, Joe, he's made five starts. He's got a 107 ERA, striking out almost 12 over nine. Sprout was somebody that he just has no business being in Brooklyn anymore. While we were talking about off the air, Joe, the numbers don't really jump out the same way for Clifford, you know, obviously offensively, but you've said before, Hitting in Brooklyn, especially as a lefty, is no easy task. There might be some underlying metrics that jump off here. Yeah, he's hitting the ball hard. He's drawing walks. His on-base percentage is up. He's hitting the ball in the yeah, air, which is a – Yeah, so he's, he's, a, he's seeing the ball well. And now you get him out of that environment. And I think the fly ball rate and the hard hit rate will play better at the double A level than it does at the high A level, which I think is almost unique to the Mets versus other organizations because not many teams have their uh, team on the end of a boardwalk at the beach, basically <laughs> is where the Cyclone Stadium is located. But obviously two of the Mets most highly regarded prospects. And, you know, this is a, a conversation that, you know, we, we need to begin to have. It could be partially planning that they had guys at levels to start 
And they said, if they meet just a certain few benchmarks, they'll go to the next level. And maybe things will get a little more patient as the summer go, uh, goes along. But in the early going, you know, this new player development system and, and the new organizational philosophy, from what I've seen, is clearly more aggressive in promoting within the confines of the minor leagues uh, than certainly the last couple of regimes. Yeah, and I think that definitely stands for Clifford, right? I mean, he hasn't even turned 21 years old yet. And like you said, he's seeing the ball well. The on-base is off the charts. But he doesn't have eye-popping home run numbers or power numbers necessarily. And they're like, hey, let's let's move him up. Now, with Spro, it's a little bit of the opposite because – or in, it's really in a great way. I mean, Sprout's turning 24 in September. If he's mowing down A-ball pitching – just get him to double A and get him to level of competition that makes a little bit more sense for him. And if he flashes, honestly, Joe and Binghamton, don't you see a scenario where Sproat could finish the year in triple A? Absolutely. I mean, they drafted him as, I mean, two years in a row, right? Third round pick, didn't sign, yeah. then second round pick, signs. Um, they put him in Brooklyn, and I think the intention was, let's have him, you know, just get comfortable against hitters that he should do well against, and he did. And he's got to watch the walks. That's something that we'll be following as he moves up through the minor league ladder. But double A is really where he belongs at the moment. And uh, if he goes and he pitches in double A, much like he did in Brooklyn, uh, he'll he'll find his way to triple A before the end of the year. So we couldn't do the show this week without discussing the series against the Braves. It felt like with about, uh, I don't know, maybe two outs left in the entire series, Joe. It was going to be a quite grim recap of the series. But the Mets, thanks to Brandon Nimmo, not a 100% healthy Brandon Nimmo, in a game you are at for Mother's Day, Joe, um, he comes through in the biggest way possible. Are you excited about taking one of the three games? No, but it did feel really different. It shows the fight of this team. McNeil didn't even look right in his at bat there um, before laying down the drag bunt, find a way to get on base, find a way to keep it moving. The Braves don't have their closer Iglesias on the mound for game three. And to be fair, he didn't really look that good against the Mets before that anyway, but you know, the Mets were able to get to their bullpen and salvage the series is what I would like to say and hover right around 500 in dramatic fashion. Yeah. Sunday's game. What stood out for me was, the Mets were down and they came back. They were down and they came back. They were down and they came back. This was something we saw during that good stretch that the Mets had in April where it felt like they could go down and they would come right back. They came back multiple times yesterday. And obviously, of course, uh, the big moment for Nemo, my mom's favorite player. I got her a City Connect jersey. Uh, I posted that picture on Twitter after the game and you could see Nemo uh, on, the, on the TV behind us. But yeah, I mean, a, a fun game to be at. It was cold. Uh, I'm, I'm ready for it to stop being cold. We're in the middle of May here. Let's let's not do this anymore. But uh, it, it was a, a good game to be at. But overall in the series, uh, the offense just needs to find that consistency. You know, Saturday, Max Fried had it going, right? And and that team was really, uh, their pitching staff was really you know, carving up the Mets on Saturday. But they need to find a way to get more consistency out of the offense because the pitching staff, even Jose Quintana, on Friday night, it's not like he pitched horribly. He just gave a couple home runs, and but the Mets just didn't have an answer offensively. And, you know, it, it's one of those things when you look at it, Pete Alonso's starting to hit the ball a little better. Brandon Nimmo's hitting the ball better. Lindor looks pretty good. J.D. Martinez got his first home run as a Met. The Mets and thank need, God he did. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But, but uh, the, those players are an absolute necessity for this offense to get going. Cause I think their offense rides on the backs of those players specifically. Uh, so, you know, two out of three, losing two out of three is not ideal, but at least the last game was a win. So it changes the vibe a little bit. Yeah. I think the bottom line is right now, after a dreadful start, Lindor, you know, halfway through may has an eight twenty three OPS, which is where you expect Francisco Lindor to be around. And Lindor is traditionally a slow starter. So He's starting to get going a little bit. Alonzo, after a dreadful slump, you, you nailed it, Joe, hitting the ball harder. Nimmo is, you don't worry about Nimmo at all. Nimmo has been really, really big for this team this year. And, and the reality is it feels like 
a little like the the air has come out of some of the balloons at the bottom of the lineup. They're not getting a ton of production from Tyrone Taylor, Harrison Bader very recently when it felt like for so long the bottom of the lineup was almost carrying the Mets when they bounced back after a tough start to the season. And there's nothing to be mad about. Those guys aren't supposed to be carrying the lineup. So the fact they can get you through a tough spot or the top of the lineup struggling, now it's time for those guys to pick it up, right? And that's what, almost in a way, that trio, that trifecta of Nimmo, if he's healthy, Lindor and Alonso are going to have to do, especially while Francisco Alvarez is still out. Because the Mets aren't, we've talked about this, like there's things that you can leave as pending and questions with this team, and that can be a glass half full at times. The Mets aren't getting any offense out of their catchers, okay? I mean, we just know that. They can't really get much defense out of their catchers right now. So Alvarez returning to this team eventually uh, is the biggest spark that they can get, but that's going to put more pressure at the guys at the top. All right, let's review our scoreboard predictions from the Braves series. A heads up, though, we will not be doing scoreboard predictions for next week because... It is the very rare show I will be missing of the year, and I have a good reason. I'm getting married. So otherwise, I really, how many times do I really miss a show, Joe? I think once, I think I miss one show the entire year, and it's usually the one vacation I take uh, after the madness of the NFL draft. And good news, I am marrying a lifelong Mets fan, so all is well, Joe. Yeah, Connor, congratulations. Excited, excited for you to- uh, You'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be in the building, as they say. Uh, but no, really happy for you guys. And uh, can't wait to be there this weekend. And uh, we'll make the show work without you next week, one way or another. But uh, yeah, just congratulations. And everybody listening, tweet Connor, send him messages, you. flood him and congratulate him. Thank you. So our Brave Series recap, pretty solid week for Joe and I, I got to say. And I have to say that off the top because it doesn't always go that way, right? Over under push was set at one for Pete Alonso home runs. Joey both pushed. He went under. Man, did he just miss that home run to de- that long yeah. ball to dead center. Michael Harris. He, I think Ronnie said it best in the broadcast. He really fools you. He kind of yeah. glides a little and puts the glove down. And you're like, oh, the ball's going out. Like he gave up on it. And then he sticks his glove up at the warning track and catches it. He really, really just missed. He's hitting the ball hard. Over under push was set at five for Christian Scott uh, strikeouts. We both went over and we called this an easy over. He had eight. We each got a point. Christian Scott, the stuff looks fantastic. Over under push was set at two for Travis Darno RBIs. Joe, you went over. I went under. Darno didn't have an RBI. So a point to me as I was very honest. I'm absolutely rooting against Travis Darno and he didn't affect this series. Over under push was set at one for Mets catching someone stealing Joe, you went under. I went under. We both got a point. (laughs) That is the saddest. They picked off Ronald Acuna twice. I was going to say, luckily, pickoffs don't count. But if they did, that and I tweeted uh, during during the game, I was like, that's one way to stop guys from stealing bases on you. Just pick them off. Is he, not to get off track here, but I had this thought while watching the series. And I know it's been a tough start to the year for him, especially after the, I'd almost call it historic year he had last year. I don't know how to label Acuna. I think he's the greatest player I've ever seen with the most like brain freeze moments. It's, it's almost jarring how many for a great, a player that truly can single-handedly win you a series. Like he could hit four home runs in a series and steal eight bases, but the ball going through his legs off the wall, picked off twice. He didn't run out that double play that killed them. uh, That killed that. He is such a bizarre player. Yeah. It's very interesting. At times he's, it's like he's almost too confident. Like on the pickoffs, I think he just knew he was like, I'm stealing. Then then obviously got picked off. But yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, sometimes I guess you have brain freezes. But yeah, Ronald Acuna, he uh the the Mets largely other other than that long home run kinda held him in check a little bit, all things considered. But man, he's he's a special player. Over under push was set at one for Mets starters going at least six innings. Joe, you pushed. I went over. And you nailed this one, Joe. Uh, one starter went at least six innings. Over under push was set at one for Mets wins. I was feeling optimistic and went over. Joe, you pushed. You get the point. You had four points this week, Joe. I had three. You lead the season series seventeen to thirteen. You've you've been on quite the roll here. I feel like I feel like we're out scoring last year by pace, but that is a total guess. So I feel like last year, if we got a point or two throughout the week, it was a big week. Yeah, I feel like we are recapping most weeks and 
like we'll look at the rundown before we hop on and be like you'll be like oh joe we, we had a good week on this on the scoreboard yeah. this week and uh we're, we're messing you know, it up where it's like we're batting around 500 each week <laughs> so very exactly. on brand very on brand for the show all right like i said i will be away um but only for one week I, it will not be a long layoff. and joe joe will be back so the show is not going anywhere of course the mets pod literally never stops let's get into some mailbag questions of course we're going to start with youtube this is from at run rin underscore who happens to play the scoreboard with us i kind of want to just read this off played the scoreboard right. with us got two points uh so finished worse than us but did get a point on the under for alonzo home runs and got a point for the mets push so if you want to keep playing the scoreboard with us please do that we'll try to get some of the results in here it's a lot of fun when the when the audience gets involved. All right, this is from a five-star review on Apple Podcasts from Sarah Gale, who said, Fun thought experiment I'm trying myself. In five years, the Mets six-man rotation is made up solely of pitchers currently in the organization, including major and minor and major leagues. Who is it? Bonus, three relievers who may or may not be starters now. My, my off-the-cuff answer, this is what Sarah's was, Senga, Tidwell, Sproat, Tong, Stewart, Hamill. Relievers, Bryce Montes de Oca, Cowboy Otani, Nolan McClain, and Edwin Diaz. Joe, does yours differ? What, hap here? what happened to Christian Scott? Did I miss that name in there? You did. Not a Christian Scott believer, Sarah. I get Sarah, Sarah, come on. Christian Scott might be the ace of this team in five years. Um, but that's an interesting one. So I, I, I like the play of Senga, but that would require a contract extension. So that would mean Senga had performed to the point because five years from he now. He could opt out, by the way, after three, he right? Opt, well, he needs to pitch a certain amount of innings, and I'm Never not mind. sure. <laughs> yeah, so that, that may be a struggle. I forget exactly what it is. I think it's innings over the second and third year. He has to combine for a certain number. Um, yeah, but Christian Scott, I really like that one, obviously. Spro. What's interesting about Brandon Spro is we talked about the command earlier, and it's one of those things that if he doesn't kind of get that at the upper levels, and this is, was the case even when he was drafted, there is some reliever risk. Uh, I love putting Cowboy Otani in the bullpen. I know the Mets are using him as a starter, and they're going to exhaust all opportunities for him to become one. Um I still think his future is probably in the bullpen. So I really like that play. Uh, Tidwell, you know, had a rough start his last time out, but I think he has a good opportunity to be a big league starter. I really like Dom Hamill. We talked about him. So I think he can make the list. Man, five years is just a long time away. It's like, so long. Is, is the Scott, return of Matt Allen ever happening? Uh, we could only hope. Uh, yeah, we could only hope. But Christian Scott might, he'll be like almost 30, I think. Five oh, years this is now. dark. I don't want to think about yeah. this. Yeah, so really great question, thought exercise, and I appreciate the effort. I think there's uh, there's going to be some pitchers drafted in the next couple months, so let's follow back up in August after the draft, and we'll and we'll circle back to this one, and I think we'll be able to build something. Senga would be thirty six, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. I mean, hey, it's, it's no, not he pitches well. He could, he he could get a short term, you know, uh, extension for sure. All right. This is another five-star review question. So thank you for leaving those, everybody. Yes. This is from FCO. Nick LaRusso was a low draft pick, and I haven't heard much buzz around him, not seen him on any top prospect list. I assume most of that is age-related, but he hit extremely well in college and seems to be continuing to do so in Brooklyn this year. How long does he have to keep it up before the, he gets considered as a legitimate prospect? Is there any underlying data suggesting he'll regress, or is he just a flat-out good hitter? Any word on his defense at third? So... Joe, this was a ninth round pick in the 2023 draft. Uh, LaRusso was somebody that just his last year at Maryland, I mean, the OPS was over 1,200. He just tore the cover off the ball. He hit 26 home runs. He drove in over 100 runs. He was getting on base literally about half of his at-bats. Didn't hit a lick in 2023 at St. Lucie in just 100 plate appearances. And this year in Brooklyn at 820 OPS. So it's it, things have been much better for him. Obviously, FCO points out, you know, the age. This is already somebody that's 23, and we don't know defensively, you know, where he's going to land. What have you seen so far, Joe? Yeah, so Nick Russo was a senior sign, which means you 
signed for well below slot as a senior. Um, he holds the University of Maryland's all-time RBI record. So he was able to a- accomplish that. And, you know, at Brooklyn, he's mixing time between third and first. I think when it comes to New someone Bientos. like that. When someone, when, <laughs> so he, he, he certainly can hit a little bit. He has a little bit of power. He hits the ball pretty hard. I think what will be the test for him as often is for these kind of older college signs that more often than not do beat up on the lower level of the minor leagues. When you get to double A, that's really just in in a general sense. When you think about player development, that's kind of a barometer where, you know, real prospects tend to emerge at that level and prospects who are not going to make it all the way to the major leagues. That's usually the level where they flame out. So if Nick LaRusso continues to perform for Brooklyn, he could find himself in Binghamton sometime this summer. And, uh, you know, that would kind of begin that test that I just talked about. All right, let me pair the last two questions for today's show together. These are both from YouTube. This is from William Grafe, 9229. Can Mark Vientos be serviceable at second base? Would love to see him get called up for Wendell and then maybe get some at-bats at McNeil's expense. Drew Smith fan said, do you think Ronnie Mauricio will be the starting second baseman in 2025? So, Joe, I think, a you know, we always have themes each season. And an early theme in this season I find you and I discussing, rightfully so, is that the Jeff McNeil situation is problematic right now. I don't know if McNeil's healthy and that plays into it too, right? Cause McNeil's been beat up going back to when he was a prospect or not considered a prospect, but second base has been a problem for the Mets this year. Right now you look at McNeil, I mean, 239 batting average, 626 OPS. We know he doesn't hit home runs. We know he doesn't steal bases. He's just not hitting the ball hard. It's as simple as that this team misses Ronnie Mauricio even more than we ever thought, because in this scenario, I think Mauricio would be nearly getting full run to show he's an everyday player. It's not that McNeil would be benched every day. I just think he'd be moved around a lot more and used as more of a situational player because of how much he struggled. And I think Mauricio would be really giving a shot. I guess we'll start there. I think Mauricio will be given the shot to be this team's second baseman in 2025. I'm not even convinced McNeil will be on this team in 2025. And then you can get to the Vientos part, Joe. I mean, and and correct me if I'm speaking out of turn. I don't think there's any world where the Mets would even give Vientos a inning at second base. Yeah, Mark Vientos, I don't think, has the lateral quickness to to handle up the middle defense at at the big league level for sure. Obviously, he was a shortstop coming through high school and in, in the low minors, but he was quickly even moved off of that position in the minor leagues. That's a big second baseman, 6'4", 220. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean Mauricio's almost there, so that that's another big second yeah. baseman. Ronnie he, looks he, pretty he, smooth though. Ronnie's a different kind of athlete than Mark Vientos is. So the first part, Mark Vientos will I'd be stunned if he got any second base looks at any point. Um Mauricio, what I think is gonna be interesting to follow over the next couple months, because Luis Angel Cunha is starting to heat up a bit down at Triple A Syracuse. Yeah. And and Jet Williams is a guy that obviously is coming off of a wrist injury. Uh, so if he comes back and starts to perform, you know, he has potential to be a second baseman long term as well. Keep an eye on what Brett Beatty does the rest of the year, because if Brett Beatty's bat, you know, continues on a downward trajectory, Ronnie Mauricio could be your third baseman. You know, that that's the flexibility that Mauricio has. He could either be your, your third baseman or, like you said, I thought he looked pretty smooth at second, though maybe a little more natural at third. I think if Mauricio comes back healthy off of this torn ACL, he's going to find himself uh, in a prime opportunity in 2025 somewhere on the diamond for the Mets. You know, you brought. I'm glad you brought up Acuna, Joe, because he has been much better in recent games. And you have to, like, let's live in a world right now, and this is a tough one, but that McNeil, just, this is just what he is right now. I mean, the OPS is below 700. He's not hitting home runs. You'd have to think there's a world, if Acuna's even average in AAA, that we can see Acuna up here in August because he steals a ton of bases, Acuna. So if you're not getting really anything offensively out of McNeil, the floor for Acuna doesn't matter because, sure, you also might not get anything offensively out of Acuna, same situation as McNeil, but Acuna can be your most lethal pinch runner from day one I would think a plus defensively and you're getting him some time 
where that's needed eventually. So I, I think this hourglass has really been flipped over. I, I, not to write off, you know, Jeff McNeil's career here, but Okunia needs one good month and McNeil needs basically to be exactly what he's been now for a while where you look at it and go, okay, I mean, and it's not a situation where I think they bring up Acuna and McNeil is just, you never hear from him again, but it just feels like a situation that the way the Mets are constructed right now, especially since they DFA'd Zach Short and we saw Short's effectiveness for the Braves. And I understand, like, is Zach Short, is he ever going to tear the cover off the ball? No, but he's a guy that is athletic, can steal bases and play defense. I mean, Joey Wendell has given the Mets nothing this year, and that was supposed to be part of the promise with him. There is a place here open at some point of the late summer for Luis Angel Acuna on this major league team. 100%. If he continues on this trajectory, I think he's up to 13 stolen bases now. So That's right. as you mentioned, he's stealing bases, and he's starting to hit the ball a little harder. He he looks more comfortable at the plate. He obviously had a really rough start uh, down, down there at Syracuse. So even if he hits, it's going to take a little bit for – his baseline stats when you type in Luis on Helicuna baseball reference to look good. Uh, that'll take a little bit, but I think, you know, with the way McNeil is, is not hitting right now, Acuna could easily force his hand, uh, you know, force their hand and he's already on the 40 man roster. So it's not like they'd have to designate some for assignment. It's simply finding the right opportunity to call him up. And, you know, this was one of the things I asked David about balancing in a year where you have the expectation to be a contender, how do you balance that as well as giving a guy like Acuna an opportunity or even Drew Gilbert, who we talked about on last week's show, where they could come up, they could play, and you deal with the fact they're going to go through tough stretches, but you coincide that with trying to contend. That's that's also a hard thing to kind of marry up, but I think Acuna has a, a possibility of forcing their hand unless Jeff McNeil just can find his way back to being the Jeff McNeil that won a batting title, hits 290 plus. 280, hit, Joe. I'll yeah. take 280. Yeah. He needs to hit for average. And, you know, I am not the biggest just batting average person yeah. generally. Like, I understand the val there is value to it, um, but more on, like, the extreme sides. But when you look at McNeil, obviously there's not a ton else he's bringing to the table offensively, so he has to hit for average. Right. And I think the reality is with the Mets, and I know we do this week after week, and some people might be saying, well, we keep waiting and we're not getting what we're hoping for. And I think some of that is true and some of that is not true. I think Lindor has turned the corner. I think Pete Alonso is going to be Pete Alonso. Brandon Nimmo, assuming he's healthy, you don't really worry about Nimmo. J.D. Martinez is going to hit. And J.D. Martinez, it's not even like J.D. Martinez looks lost at the plate. He's had professional at-bats, and he's starting to hit the ball pretty hard as well to go with the singles that he's had. Francisco Alvarez is going to be back. When you look at the way the Mets are constructed right now, they have guys in this lineup that are going to get going that are going to hit a lot of home runs, which means the supplemental guys, which McNeil has been that guy for a while, they got to get on base and make things happen. And if that's not happening, other people are going to get opportunities at some point. So it's going to be really, really interesting to track. This is the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. Remember to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review with a question, as you heard today, a five-star review, and we'll look for it for a future mailbag. Of course, you can watch every episode on SNY's YouTube channel. Become a subscriber over there, and you will never miss a show. Thanks so much, everybody. I'll be back in two weeks, but Joe will be with you next week. Talk to you soon.